Hello. It's my pleasure to welcome you back to this day number 138. Today we read 1 Samuel 2, Psalm 91, and our second reading in Romans 1. God has treasures again for us in today's readings. Let's turn to 1 Samuel 2. Yesterday, we heard of the wonderful answer to Hannah's prayer and of her determination to fulfill a very difficult vow to the Lord. Samuel might have only been three years old when Hannah gave him up to stay permanently as a Nazarite serving at the Lord's tabernacle. Hannah is such an example of a godly woman. No wonder so many girls are named after her. I noticed an interesting detail in yesterday's reading. Elkanah also had a vow. When Samuel was newly born and Hannah did not go with the family to Shiloh for the yearly sacrifices, the GNT drew my attention saying that Elkanah went to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and the special sacrifice he had promised. We don't really know exactly what Elkanah's special vow would have been, but it is conjectured by commentators that Elkanah was offering a sacrifice in fulfillment of Hannah's vow about giving birth to a son. According to the law, a wife's vow could be revoked by her husband on the day he hears about the vow. But if he doesn't forbid his wife about the vow on that day, The wife is bound by her vow, and it is logical that the husband would share responsibility. As Elkanah left that year, he told Hannah, May the Lord make your promise come true. This is a great example of doing what God commanded about vows. The principle was to always follow through whenever God's name has been invoked. To do otherwise would be to mar God's reputation. 1 Samuel 2 Hannah prayed, The Lord has filled my heart with joy. How happy I am because of what he has done. I laugh at my enemies. How joyful I am because God has helped me. No one is holy like the Lord. There is none like him, no protector like our God. Stop your loud boasting, silence your proud words. For the Lord is a God who knows, and he judges all that people do. The bows of strong soldiers are broken, but the weak grow strong. The people who once were well fed now hire themselves out to get food, but the hungry are hungry no more. The childless wife has borne seven children, but the mother of many is left with none. The Lord kills and restores to life. He sends people to the world of the dead and brings them back again. He makes some people poor and others rich. He humbles some and makes others great. He lifts the poor from the dust and raises the needy from their misery. He makes them companions of princes and puts them in places of honor. The foundations of the earth belong to the Lord. On them he has built the world." He protects the lives of his faithful people, but the wicked disappear in darkness. A man does not triumph by his own strength. The Lord's enemies will be destroyed. He will thunder against them from heaven. The Lord will judge the whole world. He will give power to his king. He will make his chosen king victorious. Then Elkanah went back home to Ramah, but the boy Samuel stayed in Shiloh and served the Lord under the priest Eli. The sons of Eli were scoundrels. 
they paid no attention to the Lord or to the regulations concerning what the priests could demand from the people. Instead, when someone was offering a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged fork. While the meat was still cooking, he would stick the fork into the cooking pot, and whatever the fork brought out belonged to the priest. All the Israelites who came to Shiloh to offer sacrifices were treated like this. In addition, even before the fat was taken off and burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the one offering the sacrifice, Give me some meat for the priest to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, only raw meat. If the person answered, Let us do what is right and burn the fat first, then take what you want, the priest's servant would say, No, give it to me now. If you don't, I will have to take it by force. This sin of the sons of Eli was extremely serious in the Lord's sight, because they treated the offerings to the Lord with such disrespect. In the meantime, the boy Samuel continued to serve the Lord, wearing a sacred linen apron. Each year his mother would make a little robe and take it to him when she accompanied her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say to Elkanah, May the Lord give you other children by this woman to take the place of the one you dedicated to him. After that, they would go back home. The Lord did bless Hannah, and she had three more sons and two daughters. The boy Samuel grew up in the service of the Lord. Eli was now very old. He kept hearing about everything his sons were doing to the Israelites and that they were even sleeping with the women who worked at the entrance to the tent of the Lord's presence. So he said to them, Why are you doing these things? Everybody tells me about the evil you are doing. Stop it, my sons. This is an awful thing the people of the Lord are talking about. If anyone sins against someone else, God can defend the one who is wrong, but who can defend someone who sins against the Lord? But they would not listen to their father, for the Lord had decided to kill them. The boy Samuel continued to grow and to gain favor both with the Lord and with people. A prophet came to Eli with this message from the Lord. When your ancestor Aaron and his family were slaves of the king of Egypt, I revealed myself to Aaron. From all the tribes of Israel I chose his family to be my priests, to serve at the altar, to burn the incense, and to wear the ephod to consult me. And I gave them the right to keep a share of the sacrifices burned on the altar. Why then do you look with greed at the sacrifices and offerings which I require from my people? Why, Eli, do you honor your sons more than me by letting them fatten themselves on the best parts of all the sacrifices my people offer to me? I, the Lord God of Israel, promised in the past that your family and your clan would serve me as priests for all time. But now I say that I won't have it any longer. Instead, I will honor those who honor me, and I will treat with contempt those who despise me. Listen, the time is coming when I will kill all the young men in your family and your clan, so that no man in your family will live to be old. You will be troubled and look with envy on all the blessings I will give to the other people of Israel, but no one in your family will ever again live to old age. Yet I will keep one of your descendants alive, and he will serve me as priest. But he will become blind and lose all hope, and all your other descendants will die a violent death." When your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, both die on the same day, this will show you that everything I have said will come true. 
I will choose a priest who will be faithful to me and do everything I want him to. I will give him descendants who will always serve in the presence of my chosen king. Any of your descendants who survive will have to go to that priest and ask him for money and food and beg to be allowed to help the priests in order to have something to eat. Now let's turn to Psalm 91. This is a favorite psalm, frequently referred to in our hymns and worship songs. It is also the psalm Satan quoted to Jesus to tempt him to jump from the pinnacle of the temple. I feel that the promise that was quoted is not just for Jesus, but is for every believer. I preach to myself here. Let's memorize and meditate upon this psalm. Psalm 91 Whoever goes to the Lord for safety, whoever remains under the protection of the Almighty, can say to him, You are my defender and protector. You are my God. In you I trust. He will keep you safe from all hidden dangers and from all deadly diseases. He will cover you with his wings. You will be safe in his care. His faithfulness will protect and defend you. You need not fear any dangers at night or sudden attacks during the day or the plagues that strike in the dark or the evils that kill in daylight. A thousand may fall dead beside you, ten thousand all around you, but you will not be harmed. You will look and see how the wicked are punished. You have made the Lord your defender, the Most High your protector, and so no disaster will strike you, no violence will come near your home. God will put his angels in charge of you to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands to keep you from hurting your feet on the stones. You will trample down lions and snakes, fierce lions and poisonous snakes. God says, I will save those who love me. I will protect those who acknowledge me as Lord. When they call to me, I will answer them. When they are in trouble, I will be with them. I will rescue them and honor them. I will reward them with long life. I will save them. Let's return to Romans 1. Yesterday we saw the theme of this letter is the gospel, the good news, and how believing this message is the center of the way God has designed and revealed for how we are saved, no matter if we are ethnically Jews or non-Jews. The start of this good news is that our relationship with God has been broken. Understanding this fact is what makes the good news good. We don't start out as nice people but as broken people. And Paul will show us in three chapters that this situation obtains for Jews who think they are so good and non-Jews who start out not even having an appearance of good. Romans 1, starting at verse 16, that thesis statement for the book of Romans. I have complete confidence in the gospel. It is God's power to save all who believe, first the Jews and also the Gentiles. For the gospel reveals how God puts people right with himself. 
It is through believing from beginning to end. As the scripture says, the person who is put right with God through believing shall live. God's anger is revealed from heaven against all the sin and evil of people whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. God punishes them because what can be known about God is plain to them, for God himself made it plain. Ever since God created the world, his invisible qualities, both his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly seen. They are perceived in the things that God has made. So people have no excuse at all. They know God, but they do not give him the honor that belongs to him, nor do they thank him. Instead, their thoughts have become complete nonsense, and their empty minds are filled with darkness. They say they are wise, but they are fools. Instead of worshiping the immortal God, they worship images made to look like mortals, or birds, or animals, or reptiles. So God has given mankind over to do the filthy things their hearts desire, and they do shameful things with each other. They exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worship and serve what God has created instead of the Creator Himself, who is to be praised forever. Amen. Because they do this, God has given them over to shameful passions. Even the women pervert the natural use of their sex by unnatural acts. In the same way, the men give up natural sexual relations with women and burn with passion for each other. Men do shameful things with each other, and as a result, they bring upon themselves the punishment they deserve for their wrongdoing. Because those people refuse to keep in mind the true knowledge about God, He has given them over to corrupted minds, so that they do things that they should not do. They are filled with all kinds of wickedness, evil, greed, and vice. They are full of jealousy, murder, fighting, deceit, and malice. They gossip and speak evil of one another. They are hateful to God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They think of more ways to do evil. They disobey their parents. They have no conscience. They do not keep their promises. And they show no kindness or pity for others. They know that God's law says that people who live in this way deserve death. Yet, not only do they continue to do these very things, but they even approve of others who do them. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for being our place of safety and our defender, because we have come to know you. You have revealed so much to mankind. We praise you for how your eternal power and divine nature are revealed in this world that you created. These qualities are invisible, Paul says, but they are nevertheless revealed for those who can perceive them. Open our spiritual eyes to see them. In addition, the gospel is so clearly and specifically revealed to us. But in spite of the amazing things you have revealed, mankind refuses to entertain the God hypothesis. And what Paul said is right. Their thoughts have become complete nonsense, and their empty minds are filled with darkness. They say they are wise, but they are fools. Lord, we know people like that. 
when they face the final judgment, they will be without excuse. So we will name them in prayer to you now, asking for your mercy on them. We ask you to open their minds to the truth. 